Thank you, Adrian. And good morning, everyone. How are you doing? I always think it's interesting that the front row is still empty, whereas the cold seats at the back, even on a day like this, are looking a little bit more full. But is it all right back there? Not too bad. I can see you've got your jackets on. Um, yeah, so as Adrian said, um, my name's Tim. Um, I'm a dad. Um, I've got four kids aged 0 to 9. And so I'm used to that moment when you get a daddy followed by a question. Some of you will be familiar with that question tone as well. You might have your own kids or might be at school or have friends with children. It might be, um, Daddy, why is it that we say one dog, two dogs, but we don't say one sheep, two sheeps? Uh, just, just is the way it is, guys. Or maybe on a trip to London we have, Daddy, why is it that we say the Tower of London and the Science Museum, but we don't say the Buckingham Palace or the Westminster Abbey? I, d I, d I don't know, guys. It just, it's just the way it is. Or, or, or Daddy, I know that infinity is the biggest thing there is, but is two infinity bigger than one infinity? Oh, yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> but, but one of the hardest questions I've ever had was asked by my second son just a few weeks home. We were on our way back from church here at the Village Hotel. And he turned to me in the car. He said, Daddy, why is God a murderer? I was kind of expecting, Daddy, what are we having for lunch? That is a serious question. Um, and I thought maybe he's talking about maybe the moments in the Old Testament where God tells his armies to go and defeat an evil king. Or, or maybe it's that part in the New Testament where you see a couple that are following Jesus but are lying about what they're doing with their money and they die. But it wasn't those stories. It was the one we're going to read this morning. It was the moment in the Moses story where God brings ten plagues upon the nation of Israel, culminating in the death of the firstborn son of every family in the land. And as we read this story this morning, you might have the same question my son has. I know I have that question as well. Your questions, they might be a little bit more broad um, about God generally. The, the passage we're reading from today all starts a couple of weeks ago in chapter 5 when Moses approaches the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh, the mighty king of Egypt, and asks him to let God's people go. And Pharaoh responds like this. He says, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Pharaoh's response might seem reasonable enough to you. This is the most powerful man probably in the world. The Lord is just the God of these, these slave group, the Israelites in Egypt. Why on earth should I do anything that he says? And actually, I think Pharaoh's um, response uh, is, probably rings true for us in the 21st century as well. We're a multicultural, diverse society, and, and the idea that you might want to follow a God, well, yeah, that's great. If you, if you found something that works for you, I'm so pleased with you, so, so pleased for you. We might even like some of Jesus' teaching, some of his emphasis on serving the poor and on justice. But the idea that God would tell us what to do and how we should live our lives, we might think with the Pharaoh, oh, who is the Lord? that I should obey him. Even the idea that God would judge us one day for the way that we've lived our lives. Maybe, God, you need to get your own house in order. If you think about all the ways that the church has damaged the world, all of the things that people have done in your name, who are you to judge me? Who is the Lord that I should obey him? You might be a follower of Jesus and still feel this way. I know that this still hides in my heart. In fact, I think if you are a follower of Jesus, if you're reading the Bible, if you're trying to learn from his teachings, trying to do the things that Jesus wants you to do, there will inevitably be moments when you think, oh, I don't know about that. That clashes with the way that I feel about something, the way that I see myself. I, I just don't want to do that. You might have the same response that Pharaoh did. And today we're going to attempt to answer this question, who is the Lord that we should obey him? Before we go any further, let me quickly recap on where we've got so far, just in case the names that I've mentioned don't mean anything to you. So this story is set in around 1200 or 1300 BC. Um, we're in the land of Egypt, where there is Egyptians, obviously, but there's also the Israelites. They're living together. The Israelites arrived in this land about 400 years before um, as just one family, but they've grown, but they've grown to be a slave people. They're working long days in horrible conditions. They can be killed at their master's whim. And for fear that they were growing so quickly, the Pharaoh has issued this command, that if you see the boy be as a boy, kill him. If an Egyptian midwife saw that an Israelite woman had given birth to a boy, they were to throw him in the Nile. 
And one of those boys was Moses, who's the focus of this teaching series, who actually escaped, um, was raised in an Egyptian household many years later, ended up in the wilderness. He's coming to about 90 years old. uh, God approaches him. He has an encounter with God. He says, go back to Egypt and tell the Pharaoh to let my people go. And then we hear this passage. He approaches Pharaoh. He says, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh says, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Today we see what happens next. We're going from chapters 7 through to chapter 10, and we're telling the famous story of the plagues. You might have seen it on the the big screen um, in the production Prince of Egypt. You might have seen it on the West End stage um, more recently. But this is a famous story, and in it, God really um, answers the, the questions that Pharaoh has been asking. Pharaoh says, I do not know the Lord. In the plagues, God says, I'm going to reveal myself to you and to the Egyptians and to the Israelites. And Pharaoh says, I will not let Israel go free. And in the plagues, God says that he's going to rescue his people. He reveals who he is and he rescues his people. He could have done it differently. He could have wiped Egypt off the face of the earth, but he didn't. In his mercy, he reveals, he gives them a chance to respond, and then he rescues his people. We see this at the start of the passage today, chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 4. The Lord speaks to Moses. He says, then I will lay my hand on Egypt with mighty acts of judgment I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. He reveals himself, see that? And then when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it, he rescues his people. But I want to start by asking you a question. How do you feel when God says he's going to bring a mighty act of judgment? Rachel and I um, were lying in bed not too long ago, and we heard the sound of running water in our bedroom, and that wasn't too unusual because we were in an attic room, and there was a tank there, but it kept on going, and it kept on getting louder, and so we thought, we need to get someone in to come and investigate this. So a plumber arrived, they spent some time in our house, and eventually downstairs, they lifted up some floorboards, and they found a kind of a bit of shoddy plumbing work that had broken, and there was water spilling all over the house. Now, at that point, the plumber had said, I've I've revealed this problem, but I'm just going to leave it as it is, or I'm just going to put a little bit of tape around it. I think we would have called him negligent, would have called him a bad tradesman, would have said, you're putting our house in jeopardy. If he hadn't judged, we'd have criticized him. Or imagine that you go to see a doctor, and she does an examination of your body and finds a growth. She she reveals it to be a a tumor or something, but, but just lets it stay doesn't do anything about it, doesn't judge it, doesn't remove it, doesn't make you any better. We would say that she hasn't performed her duty to care. What I'm hoping to show us in this story is that God's judgment for the world is motivated by his love for the world. God deals with the destructive powers of evil because he cares. Now, in in this nation, in Egypt, at this point in history, there are these people that have been oppressed, people who are slaves, whose children have been killed. And as we see, God steps in, but he doesn't just step in to save them. He also reveals himself to the Egyptians who've been worshiping false gods and basing their lives on flimsy foundations. God reveals the problem and he rescues his people. There are 10 plagues. We're not going to go through all in detail, but let's look at a couple. In the first plague, God turns the Nile into blood. This is chapter 7, verse 16, for those following you with me. The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, the Israelites, has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now, you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this, you will know that I am the Lord. With the staff that is in his hand, I will strike the water on the Nile and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die and the river will stink and the Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. And the first thing we need to know about the Nile is that the Nile is the reason that Egypt is such a prosperous and wealthy nation. Egypt was actually called the gift of the Nile. 
You might think that's the wrong way around. Surely the Nile is a gift to Egypt, but the ancient people didn't see it that way. They said every year the, the Nile has its, its bur- it would burst its banks and the land surrounding the Nile would become so fertile and that the farmers could farm the land. And that was why Egypt was so rich and so wealthy and so prosperous. And so they would say, oh, Egypt is actually the gift of the Nile. And in response, the Egyptians worshipped the god of the Nile. This is happy. <laughs> and happy literally made them happy, made them prosperous, the God of the Nile. Now, I know many of us are progressive folks, and I'd be surprised if any of you had a statue of happy in your living room, but you know, feel free to correct me if that's wrong. Don't imagine you would come downstairs each morning and bow your knees before happy. But in different, maybe more subtle ways, even in the 21st century, I think we can orient our lives around the things that we think will make us happy and make us prosperous. Oh, I just want a little bit more money. I do everything I can to get that. I just want to change job. I, I just want my children to be successful. I just want to be married. <laughs> I just want a boyfriend or a girlfriend. We can shape everything our lives around these things. And many of those things are good and fine things. I've got kids. I've got a job. I'm happily married. They may, they may be good things to get, but they are lousy gods to serve. If they become the ultimate thing, then we're in trouble. Now, I really like my job, but if I pursue it to the detriment of following Jesus, I know that I'm never going to be happy. I really love my wife. <laughs> You'll be pleased to hear. She's a, she's a great partner, but she would make a terrible God. <clears throat> she can't make me happy. I can't make her happy in the way that are our deepest levels we need to be. We can only find that in Jesus. If we go solely to each other, we'll be disappointed. When Jesus walked the earth, he said, I have come that you might have life and life in all of its fullness. He said, the only way that you can, in the deepest part of you, find happiness and satisfaction is to be in relationship with your maker, to find peace with God, to find hope in him. The same was true for the Egyptians and the Israelites as it was for us today. They spent their time worshipping happy, but happy couldn't make them happy, so God in his mercy brings judgment. He reveals the truth about what this so-called God is and how much greater he is. Pharaoh doesn't listen. The wonderful river is turned to blood, but God makes it clear in this first plague that he, not the river, is, is the source of prosperity and happiness and, and joy and satisfaction. And We can spend our lives chasing after these things, neglect the things that matter most, but God in his mercy judges. He reveals himself instead. Second plague, or the third plague, but the second one we're going to talk about is gnats. Now, I don't know about you, but there's one thing that I find extremely infuriating, and that's when I find a fly in my house. Let me tell you why. Rachel and I have worked quite hard to make our lounge a relaxing place to be. We've got a nice, comfortable sofa. Thank you, Facebook Marketplace. We've got a, a nice rug, and um, we've got some good speakers. And so when I get in at the end of the day, I can look around at this luxurious room that we've built and think, right, I'm now going to relax. I can turn on the music. A fly has entered the room. I'm a little bit on edge. It's OK. I'll wait for it to go. I'll maybe wander over. Technique number one, I'll open the window to see if that works. So, right, Rachel is still oblivious at this point. She seems not to be able to hear the fly, but I am definitely getting more and more frustrated. I try several different techniques. I've, I've tried to perfect the cushion waft. Some of you might have tried the same. I've tried to catch it in a glass. I've tried to up the ante a little bit and get a hard book out, but the fly still seems impervious to my threats. I've bought fly-repellent candles. They don't seem to work. And I've been on Amazon.co.uk and bought the best-rated electric fly squatter that I could find and still have very little success. Eventually, I might see the fly heading towards the window. I get ready. I get ready to slam it shut. Go, fly, go. I think the world is waiting for you and peace and quiet are waiting for me, only for the, the last minute the fly to turn around and come back into the room. And I'm reminded, once and for all, how little control that I have. Imagine how the Egyptians felt. The Egyptians of chaise lounge lounging, grape eating, wine sipping, palm tree fanning fame. Imagine how those Egyptians felt when every piece of dust in the land was turned to gnats. I'm sure, like me, they felt that they had it all. They created this wonderful place for them to live. They created a great empire, 
But God, in his mercy, showed them that in an instant, it could all be taken away, that nothing more than little bugs could, spend, could ruin what they'd spent their lives building. The plagues continue to build. The second plague, the frogs will come up upon you and your people and all of the officials. But Pharaoh sees that there's relief and he hardens his heart. Then come the gnats. The magicians have actually been able to recreate the first two plagues. They can't recreate the first one. So they go to the Pharaoh and they say, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart is hard and he will not listen. Next come flies. Dense swarms of flies poured into Pharaoh's palace and into the houses of the officials. Throughout Egypt, the land was ruined by the flies. And actually, at this point, we see Pharaoh trying to start bargaining with the Lord. He says, I'll let you go and offer your sacrifices, but you must not go very far. I don't know if you've had a similar reaction when God told you to do this, and you said, well, I'm not going to do this, but I'm going to do this. Pharaoh hardened his heart. The plagues start ratcheting up. All the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one animal belonging to the Israelites died. Pharaoh investigated and found that not one of the animals of the Israelites had died, yet his heart was unyielding, and he would not let the people go. Then come boils. Moses Moses takes a handful of soot from the furnace. He tosses it up in the air. And we read that festering boils break out on people and animals throughout the land. And then the final three plagues, you can see they're getting more and more intense as they go. They started with the river, then with the frogs, then with the gnats. And now we head to the skies. Hail. Yahweh is not just the God over the Nile, but he's the God Almighty. Those officials who feared the word of the Lord hurried to their slaves Hurry to bring their slaves and their livestock inside when the hail starts falling. But those who ignored the word of the Lord left their slaves and livestock in the field. Number eight is the locust. Pharaoh tries bargaining again. He says, I'll let only the men go. No, he says, Lord, you let my men and the women and the children go. But he will not, let, he will not yield. And then penultimately comes darkness. This is maybe the most revealing plague of all. If Pharaoh was in any doubt about who he was dealing with, surely the one who can turn day and night to darkness for three days would would quash any doubt that was in his mind, but still he doesn't let his people go. And then comes the devastating tenth plague. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, the firstborn of all the livestock as well. God had described his own people as his firstborn son earlier in this book. He's seen that son enslaved, abused. He's seen their children murdered. And in response, he says, if you will not let my firstborn son go, then every firstborn son in Egypt will die. Why does God do it? Why does God judge And I think that God is coming to judge the world. Sometimes the picture that comes into my mind is of a a distant deity that in time gone past has set out a list of arbitrary rules of right and wrongs that have little relevance to my life today and that he's just waiting like a, a bad teacher to mark us pass or to mark us fail. That he's cold hearted, power hungry, that he's he's controlling, he just wants things his way. But I think this story shows us that God judges because he loves. He loves his people so much who have been so mistreated and so abused, but he loves the Egyptians as well, so much so that he will reveal himself so that they have a choice to come to him, so that they can set their deities aside and instead worship the one true God. He's like that good builder ripping out the foundations. He's like that doctor ripping out the tumor. He's like a good parent protecting his children. And we said at the start, didn't we, that judgment is sometimes we don't, something we don't like the idea of, but I guess I want to put it to you that if we're Pharaoh, we don't like the idea that God is going to judge. But if we are the Israelites, it is very good news indeed. For many today, the idea that Jesus is coming back to judge the world is something that we should celebrate. If you're broken, if you're struggling to feed your family, if you've been abused, if you've been mistreated, the news that one day Jesus is coming back and that every wrong will be made right is very good news indeed. If you were a man or a woman in Nazi Germany, if you were a black person when the KKK were at their their peak in America, if you were on the Cambodian fields at the time of Pol Pot's, the the news that one day God is coming coming back to judge the world, that those things will be no more, is something that we should celebrate. 
Jesus promises us a world where evil regimes won't flourish, where racism won't be a thing anymore, where wars will just be a distant memory. But in order for that to happen, he needs to return. He needs to say, these things are not right. They cannot be a part of it anymore. Jesus needs to come and judge the world, to rip those things apart. I think he needs to do it in the world, but if I'm honest, he needs to do it in my heart as well. Because I know that at times, I'm like the Israelites, looking forward for God coming back, but at times, I'm like the Pharaoh, saying, I want to be the captain of my own ship. I want to be the master of my soul. I want to think for myself. I want to determine things myself. Who are you, God, to tell me what to do? I want to live my life this way. That God, that God doesn't leave me as I am, that he judges me, that he re- replaces my heart, that he shapes it, that he challenges it, that he disciplines it. It's something that I cherish. It's not something that I should fear. It means that he's still caring for me. He's still working on me. It means I still have a chance now before it's too late. Now, I heard it said recently that if you're doing something in your life, maybe in secret, that you know that God wouldn't want you to be doing that you'd be deeply ashamed of if other people knew about it, then maybe the most horrifying thing that you could imagine would be that secret becoming public. I put it to you that there's one thing that's worse, and that's not being found out. It's getting to the end of your life and never having yielded, never having turned, never having offered that thing back to Jesus, having lived a life far less than what he had for you, maybe even putting your eternal future with him at jeopardy. God judges because he loves us, because he is merciful, because he wants to reveal to us the way things truly are, reveal how great and how good he is, and rescue his people. Does that answer all of the questions that I have about this story? Honestly, no. I still find myself asking, despite having prepared this message this week, God, was there not something else that you could have done? Did the firstborn sons all really have to die? Couldn't put an age limit on it. Wasn't there something that you could have done differently? And I've turned the pages in the chapter and I've looked for the answer. And the hardest thing I'll say this morning is that I don't think the Bible gives us an answer. I don't actually think it tries. At no point does it try and defend or explain why God has done what he's done. And maybe that's because the questions that would have been asked when this book was first written two and a half thousand years ago wouldn't have been the questions that I have. I guess it is a little bit presumptuous of me to assume that everyone would have the same questions that I do. But in moments like that, we are still faced with a choice. We can either judge God, we can view him as cruel or as a tyrant. We can get on our judgment seat and decide what he is like, pass judgment on him. Or we can consider the possibility that if there really is a God who has made all things, if he knows the heart of every man, if he knows the end from the beginning, then maybe there are some things that he understands that I don't. There's reasons he does things that I can't comprehend. And instead to read this book as I think it is given to us, which is a reminder that in the face of an evil empire, God did not forget his people, but he stepped in and rescued them. And it's a precursor to the moment that Jesus does the same. See, what makes it easier to read this story is that in the New Testament we read that in Jesus we see the fullness of God revealed. The book of Hebrews tells us if we want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. He is the perfect image of God. And in Jesus we see the good and righteous judge taking upon himself the judgment that was due to all of the world. We see the God of justice facing justice on our behalf. You know, we see that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his firstborn son, so that our firstborn sons and daughters may not die, but have eternal life. That all who place their trust in him may not die, but have eternal life. That we may be transformed by his power. We might come back into right standing before God. We might be declared to be in the right. So on that day that Jesus returns, that we may be part of the kingdom that he will make and not be thrown out in the darkness. And I'm convinced on that day that I won't be pointing the finger at God. I won't be saying, oh, but God, you could have done it like this. But I'll be seeing them, his mercy on me, his grace towards me and my friends and my family and all who choose to place their trust in him and celebrating him, celebrating that God, thanking him for everything that he has done. There is one more thing 
that I want to say about this passage. I'm going to end here, so if the band want to come up. I think this passage pleads with us. I think it pleads, do not harden your hearts. In the New Testament book to the Hebrews, the author writes this. He says, so as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The author to the Hebrews obviously thinks this isn't just something that Pharaoh could do, but something that we are all at risk of doing as well. That we can read about God, we can read the Bible, we can hear every word that's been spoken this morning, we can know the things that he wants us to do, we can walk in the world and see the beauty of God's creation, we can know in our hearts that God is real, and yet we can still harden our hearts towards him. We can ignore him for just one more week. We can log on to that website just one more time. We can avoid that apology that we really need to make. We can harden our hearts bit by bit till it's just a heart of stone. You know, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I could read this story this morning, and I could think, oh, I'm so glad that I'm like the Israelites, that when Jesus comes back, he's going to save me, and he's going to judge those around me. But when Jesus walked in this world, he saved his harshest judgments often for the leaders of Israel, for the religious folk who looked great on the outside, who rocked up at the temple every Sunday morning, but whose inside their hearts were cold. These people that we've been speaking about this morning, the Israelites, a few months later find themselves in the wilderness, having seen everything that God has done, worshipping a golden calf, an Egyptian God. It is possible, I think, to know what God has done, to know who he is, to see his mighty power at work, and still to harden our hearts to him. It means we won't live the life that God wants us. At worst, it means we get to the end of our lives and realize we never really knew him. So I want to plead to you this morning, if you hear God speaking, if you feel the thump in your chest, if your brain's spinning, if you know that God is asking you to do something or wants you to respond to him, please do not harden your heart. God cares for you so much. He loves you so much. Whether you've been a Christian for many years or whether you're just exploring Christianity, I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so pleased that you're with us. And I know this has been a relatively heavy morning. I want to encourage you not to harden your hearts, to learn from this story about a God who steps in when we're in trouble, a God who rescues when we're in need, a God who offers mercy to those who say yes, a God who promises a better life to those who trust him. I'm going to finish by reading this. The writer to the Hebrews continues. He says this, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. You're like a circle that floats around me, keeping me safe and sound. And when I fall, you've tied a rope to me. You're blessing me every day.